So what page is majesty on? Uh, 107. Page 107, we're going to do majesty. And then I rejoice in your love. All right, could you all rise, please? I go off on me, I never know. Okay, first one's Majesty. Majesty, worship His Majesty. Unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem praise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify, Christ Jesus the King. Oh, majesty, worship His majesty. Unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority. Love from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Our Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. Flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. One more we're going to do. I rejoice in your love. Holy, holy Lord, you are my strength in my hot tower. Holy, holy Lord, you're the rock on which I stand. Holy, holy Lord. I put my trust in your great power, holy Lord, my salvation is in your hand. Oh Jesus, your faithfulness is to me a mighty fortress. I rejoice in your love, I rejoice in your love, oh Jesus, your victory. Is the truth that sets me free. I rejoice in your love. I rejoice in your love. Holy, holy Lord, you are my God. There is no other holy. Holy Lord, I will lie beneath your wings. Holy, holy Lord, you are my shield and my deed. Defender, holy, holy Lord, when trouble comes, you cover me. Oh, Jesus, your faithfulness is to me a mighty fortress. I rejoice in your love. I rejoice in your love. Oh, Jesus, your victory is the truth that sets me free. I rejoice in your love, I rejoice in your love, I rejoice in your love. You may be seated, and I'm going to 
play an, one more song. This one's a new one I just wrote that's on the... We just put the new group of songs that I wrote up on the website, and the, the name of the collection of songs is Rejoice. This one's called Run To You. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. I do that all the time. Uh, that's what happens when you get old. Uh, could you please turn your... Good morning. And please turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Our verse this morning that we're covering in 1 Thessalonians. Remember, we're in the book of Thessalonians in our Sunday classes. We're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. And uh, in this verse, we'll see that Paul Silvanus expressed to the Thessalonians their great desire to see them again. And there's a great metaphor. There's several metaphors in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, which express Paul Silvanus and Timothy's uh, great love and concern for the Th- uh, Thessalonian Christian community. And it actually gives us some insight into a, 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 the heart of a, a great pastor. The Apostle Paul Silvanus were great pastors, Timothy, and how a pastor should be in his attitude toward his uh, congregation. And so this is uh, give us some insight into the mind of the Apostle Paul, uh, that godly mind that he had, the great mind that Apostle Paul had. And also, you could say, with Silvanus and Timothy. 
Timothy. So that's our, our, our subject here this morning. And just a few announcements before we have our opening prayer. Uh, just a few announcements. Our class schedule is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays. Uh, Tuesday, Thursday, excuse me, I keep saying Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We used to be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Tuesday and Thursday from 7 to 8 p.m. We have a prayer meeting at the end of class on Thursday where our internet people could join us. We have our Sunday class uh, is uh, usually 9 to about uh, 10 or 9, 10, 15. When we have the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of each month, it usually runs to around 10, 30. Sometimes it's just 10, 15 on that class because it's a little bit longer because of the communion service. And... Uh, uh, also, if you uh, so for those that's for the people who are unfamiliar with our ministry, hit our website. We're also a, a house church. We, li- have, we live here. We're, uh, we meet here in Marion, Iowa, in our house church, Titus and Jody Thompson's home. And so we uh, they open up their home to us three days a week. So, uh, which uh, I'm very appreciative. So uh, we're just a house church. We we, we have a, a, a big following on the internet. So uh, you know some of these people we contact us and some people some of these people actually contribute to our ministry. And if you are led by the Holy Spirit to contribute to this ministry, uh, it uh, we are, uh, remember it says in Galatians 6:6 6, those who are taught the word of God to share all good things with those who teach him. So if you are benefiting from the teaching uh, you should uh, take care of, uh, you should support us. That's your obligation. And of course, if you belong to another ministry, I know there's other people that belong to other ministries. Well, your first responsibility is to your pastor, whoever he may be that you're going. So I know there's some people that go to other churches that they listen to us. So uh, he, he, your pastor is where you meet is uh, and go attend those services. He's your first responsibility. But, uh, you know, you can, uh, people send a, a, to our, our our P.O. box is on the website. Some people send checks, and some people use PayPal. That's really convenient. So I, uh, if I was, I'd be using PayPal, too, if I was many of you. So uh, that, that, that's, uh, you know, again, where our website is, www.wenstrom.org. We have a Facebook page. Just go under Bill Wenstrom, Google me, and, uh, and then we have a Facebook page as well as, as a YouTube page. So... Um, some people use YouTube rather than our website. So, but uh, all of our classes are recorded, video and audio. Uh, Titus Thompson is the one who designed the website. He's the one who maintains it, and he does our internet. And uh, so he's a very important part of what we do here. And uh, so, um, uh, although we don't we don't delete any of our classes, video and audio that we've done. So, in fact, every audio cl- class that we've ever done since I've been in Iowa, which is like seventeen, eighteen years this August is on our website. So we don't delete any of these. And since we've been doing video, we haven't deleted any of our video classes. So everything we had at Prairie View, uh, we have on that website still. So uh, we go through the different books of the Bible. We're an expository type ministry. That means we go uh, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, book by book through the different books of the Bible. We alternate between Old Testament and New Testament. In our weekday classes, we're doing the book of Haggai. We just started that a couple of weeks ago. And then, of course, Sunday classes, we're doing First Thessalonians. In between books, we'll do different subjects, like we just did recently in our weekday classes, the remnant of Israel. And in our Sunday classes, before we did First Thessalonians, we did the rapture, the resurrection of the church. So uh, all those things, we have over a 1,000 written articles on our website. You can also see a lot of our written articles Articles I put on a, a thing called Academia Edu. It's just a place that scholars y- use. So I sometimes I throw a lot of my stuff up there. So which is kind of cool because we're we're getting quite a following uh, on uh, on Academia Edu, which is pretty pretty interesting. And you meet get to meet some different uh, 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 pastors and graduate students and all kinds of stuff. So like that's like more of a scholarly kind of website thing. So, but is cool. We're, we're we're getting the word out in all different areas. So that's that's what we're here for. So. I think that's about it for the, uh, for the announcements. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. We do this to get ourselves ready to hear what the Spirit's going to say through the teaching of the Word of God. We need to confess our sins. If we're out of fellowship with God because we're committed an act of sin, mental, verbal, or over it, and we haven't confessed it, we're out of fellowship with God, and we're not going to be able to understand the Word of God and make application. We might understand it academically, but the Bible is a spiritual phenomenon. The Holy Spirit inspired the Scriptures. Uh, that makes it unlike any other book. It's like other human books because human beings did write the Bible, but the difference is with, from that and other books, the Bible from other books, is that these men wrote, the, the, the wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So if we're out of fellowship with God, we need to confess the sin. We res- that restores us to fellowship, and then we maintain that fellowship by obeying what the Holy Spirit teaches us in the Scriptures. That's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. So, if there's anything that's bothering you, or disturbing or distracting to you, and we all have problems and difficulties, we all got pressures, and we all have our own individual set of circumstances, I understand that, and so we're all, including myself, 
under pressure in certain areas. So what I do, and I've told you guys to do this too, you can do it First Peter 5, 7, says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. Or you can do what Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, tell your request to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So uh, you have a choice between what the spirit says and what your flesh says and the devil's world says. Being anxious is something that the, is government, uh, that's the fl- what flesh will do, the sin nature. That's what the devil would like you want, want you to do. But God, the Holy Spirit says, don't, you, don't be anxious about anything. In fact, it's more emphatic in the Greek. Absolutely anything you could say. So whatever is going on in your life, pray about it and don't be worried about it. Uh, prayer is the spiritual thing to do. And then the result, the, 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 the promise is the res- of this, doing this, is that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And it's very anxiety, when it becomes sin, it, it blocks out what God's trying to tell us. Uh, you know, it, we can't, if we're anxious about something uh, and it, it, it gets to become to the point where it's sin and we allow it to control ourselves and we get depressed or we get angry and lash out because we have different ways of expressing our anxiety where you realize it or not. Some people, they get quiet, they don't say anything, they shut the shades, they get depressed or some people just lash out for no good reason. That's expressing their anxiety many times. So you can't, you can't hear and apply God's word if you're out of fellowship because of anxiety. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for everyone that is here assembled in the Thompson home and those who might be viewing or listening to this class live through the website or a later date through the recordings on the website or YouTube. We just thank you for each and every person. We thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson and their hospitality and opening up their home to us. We thank you, Father, for Titus's work with the sound and the recordings and uh, so that people can, in other parts of this country and the world, listen into our services. And so we pray give him wisdom in that area this, this morning. We thank you for him and his service and the people taking advantage of the technology and the technology itself, which is phenomenal. And uh, so we could reach around the world, even though we're just this little house church in Iowa. We just thank you, Father, for your grace, your mercy, your love, the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for your work on our behalf in eternity past and electing us to a fellowship and a relationship with you, your Son, and the Spirit and predestining us to be conformed to the image of your son, giving us a plan to become like your son here in time. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit from regeneration to resurrection, and also the work, person and work of your son, Jesus Christ, the God-man, your one and only son. And we just thank you for the great sacrifice at Calvary that both you, he, and the Holy Spirit had uh, performed for us or uh, made for us uh, 2,000 years ago. So we pray, Father, that you would help us to grow in love toward you and each other, everyone in this ministry reflecting your love in our relationships and interactions with each other and all members of the human race. We thank you, Father, for this study in First Thessalonians. We pray that your Holy Spirit would do a mighty work through your people. We pray that the Spirit would speak to each person individually and also as a corporate unit, help people to learn, understand, and apply what they're being taught. And we also pray that you would help me to be your instrument that by the power of the Spirit I can communicate your full counsel to your people so that they could receive their spiritual food. We just thank you again for this uh, study in First Thessalonians, and we pray it would be again uh, a great blessing to the body of Christ and ultimately bring glory to you as we apply what we're being taught in this great book. So, Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You should be at First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Again, I said my, my, our subject here is First Thessalonians 2.17. And as a reminder, that verse, as we'll see this morning, it, it reveals that Paul and Silvanus express in this verse to the Thessalonian Christian community their great desire to see them again. We've got to remember the context historically. Remember, we studied Acts 17, 1 through uh, 11, and we saw that uh, gives the account of Paul and Silvanus' visit to Thessalonica. They evangelized the Jews in that 
that city. But then many, then they, the many Jews uh, turned against them. And what the, that passage in Acts 17 doesn't reveal, uh, but First Thessalonians does reveal, is that Paul Silvanus went to the Gentile uh, community and evangelized them, and many got saved. And uh, what we see is that eventually they were uh, uh, ran out of town by the Jewish unbelievers in Thessalonica, according to Acts 17. Though we know nothing about the Thessalonian, uh, the Gentiles being evangelized in that passage, First Thessalonians teaches, shows us that. So they were run out of town; they had to leave abruptly because of the persecution from unbelieving Jews in the th- city of Thessalonica. And this is why Paul and Silvanus penned this letter. And in fact, they, uh, they, they, they got, actually it's a response to the news that Timothy brought back to them because they, they were so worried that these, uh, the Thessalonian Christian community would give in and believe the slanderous attacks being made against Paul and Silvanus by the, not just the unbelieving Jews in Thessalonica, but the, no, the non-believing, unbelieving, unregenerate Gentiles in that city who would be family and friends and contemporaries in that city of the Thessalonian, members of the Thessalonian Christian community. So they were very concerned that this was going to happen. And so they wrote, they sent Timothy, and we know based upon this, the contents of this letter, like 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5, that Timothy brought back good news that the Thessalonians' faith was continuing, the faith in the gospel after their justification. They were continuing to be obeying the gospel, the word of God that they were taught by Paul and Silvanus. So this, is, this letter is basically also a follow-up, basically saying, we want to go see you again. Uh, he, we were prevented by Satan from doing this, as we'll see. And so, uh, this morning. So, we do have every intention of coming back to Thessalonica and ministering to you and fellowshipping with you. So, they didn't. They were trying to reassure the Thessalonian Christian community, Paul and Silvanus were, that they had every intention to come back. And they weren't going to abandon them. And that that's what... The non-believers in the city said they were going to abandon you, you Thessalonians. Paul and Silvanus are just like all these other philosophers of the day who were charlatans and exploited people for money. Uh, the, the, uh, but Paul and Silvanus said, we're not like that. In fact, we saw the first tw- uh, 12 verses of chapter 2. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy were defending their ministry from these slanderous attacks being made against them by the, the non-believing com- uh, community in Thessalonica. So we're going to st- look at verse 17. And verses 17 through uh, uh, verses 17 through tw- uh, 20 of uh, uh, First Thessalonians are, form a paragraph, as you'll see, in your, as you can see in many of your English Bibles. So look at First Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. We'll pick it up there. But you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, about our coming to you. It is not proven to be purposeless. But although we suffered earlier and were mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of of God in spite of much opposition. For the appeal we make does not come from error or impurity or with deceit. But just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we declare it not to please people, but God who examines our hearts. For we never appeared with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness, nor to seek glory from people, either from you or from others. Although we could have imposed our weight as apostles of Christ. Instead, we became little children among you. Uh, one of the many metaphors in this, uh, several metaphors in this chapter, which express Paul and Silvanus and Timothy's great love and concern for the Thessalonian Christian community. So we became like little children among you, like a nursing mother caring for her own children with such affection for you. We were happy to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. For you recall, brothers and sisters, our toil and drudgery by working night and day so as not to impose a burden on any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, as to how holy and righteous and blameless our conduct was toward you who believe. As you know, we treated each one of you as a father treats his own children. Another metaphor there. Exhorting and encouraging you and insisting that you live in a manner worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and his glory. Now, we go to a transition in the chapter. Verse 13 uh, is a a new section because verses 13 through 16, as I mentioned last week, are actually turned to a discussion uh, to the Thessalonian Christian community. The first 12 verses were about Paul Silvanus to defend their ministry. Verses 13 through 16 is, is primarily the emphasis is about the Thessalonians. Verse 13, and so we too, 
constantly thank God that when you, Thessalonians, received God's message that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human message, but as it truly is, God's message, which is at work among you who believe. Verse 14, for you became imitators, brothers and sisters, of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, because you too, like, suffer the same things from your own countrymen as they, in fact, did from the Jews. Verse 15, who killed these Jews, these unsaved Jews, killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us severely. Not every Jew who was a non-believer was doing this or had done this. This is talking about those Jews who had done these things. So he goes on to say, they're displeasing to God and are opposed to all people because they're forbidding people to receive the gospel. Verse 16, because they hinder us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. Thus, they constantly fill up their measure of sins, but wrath has come upon them completely. Now, as we left off last Sunday, those verses that we just read in 13 through 16 have two purposes. One, it's to encourage the Thessalonian Christian community that they're not alone. There are other people in the world that are Christians that are suffering for their faith and they're being persecuted. Now, we pointed out that persecution doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's going to kill you. Persecution comes in various forms. You could be ostracized because of your being a Christian. You could be made fun of because of you're a Christian and you're ridiculed for being a Christian. I know people in our ministry who have faced that at school or have faced that in their jobs and whatnot or families. And uh, so that persecution can take various forms. It doesn't necessarily have to be physical violence, although that's the ultimate of persecution. But this is a second purpose. The other one is to to express, uh, to promote unity between the Thessalonian Christian community and the, and the, the, uh, which were Gentiles and the Jewish Christian community in Judea. So, Paul, like he did in like Romans 14 and in Ephesians 2, 11 through 19, he's talking about that both Jew and Gentile believers are united because there, there was a culture shock. The Jews prior to Christ coming never had any, ex- any experiences with Gentiles. They wouldn't even go into their house. Even Peter had to be given a vision three times in Acts 10 that permitted, it made clear to him, it's all right to go to a Gentile home and eat with Gentiles. And so that was something foreign to the Jews under the law. So when they got into the church through faith in Jesus Christ, the Jews and the Gentiles had to learn to operate in love toward each other. And so that's the great thing about Christianity. It, because of God's love and we're commanded to love one another as Christ has loved us, it promotes unity uh, between races and genders. And, 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 and uh, it, that's very important. So the blacks and the whites should be able to get along with each other in the church. Uh, I, I don't like particularly hearing, you know, this is a black church or this is a white church. It, it should never be identified as that at, at all. It's not a Chinese church. I mean, it might be only Chinese people in the area. I don't know. But my point is all races are welcomed into the body of Christ. Through faith alone and Christ alone, all the races should be, uh, uh, be able to get along with each other simply through operating in God's love. So there we finish off the first 16 verses. Now look at verse 17, and we'll read all the way to 20, verse 20. But when we were separated from you, brothers and sisters, for a short time, in presence, not in affection, we became all the more fervent in our great desire to see you in person. For we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, in fact, tried again and again, but Satan thwarted us. Notice that Satan can prevent certain things from taking place among members of the body of Christ. You need to take that in mind. Satan is the great, uh, the great enemy of the church. Paul made clear that in Ephesians 6, uh, 6 12. Satan is not, uh, yes, Satan has got his armies and he, he is, deceives the whole world. And he is, uh, he is doing that and he's the God of this world temporarily. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. But his number one f- thing is to attack us, the church. Doesn't matter how little we are or how big you are, he will go after you. And in fact, the enemy is doing everything he can to have you stop not coming here, to get you to not listen to me, uh, to try to go- cause personality problems in the body of Christ, to promote that and instigate things. That's what they do. And that's why, that's why church splits. That's simply the product of people listening to Satan and his enemy and the enemy and not listening to the Holy Spirit. It says operate in love and forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. There are problems and personality problems in the body of Christ because the enemy and people are making bad volitional decisions. So you've got to be aware that Satan's out 
to just trying to destroy what we're doing and trying to destroy you and your, uh, for your positive volition of the word of God and coming to Bible class and serving and, get, and, 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 and uh, basically living your life in light of the, the Bama seat in eternity where you're going to have to give an account to Christ for your time, talent, and treasure to see if you were a good steward with these things. So, uh, so there we have, uh, he says in verse uh, 19 then, for who is our hope? or joy, or crown to boast of before our Lord Jesus at his coming. Is it not, of course, you? For you are our glory and joy. And that glory of joy of Paul and Silvanus and Timothy is when they get rewards for their faithful service to the Thessalonians. This is what I look forward to. Okay, uh, I, I don't. We don't have a big church. We don't have a. Nobody's giving me a lot of applause, and not that I need it. But there's not a lot. You're in the middle of Iowa with a couple of families in your churches, and it's very easy to get discouraged. Okay, and there are other pastors who, who, who got even worse. And not that this is bad, but I'm just saying it's difficult sometimes because your nature is you want to feel appreciated. You want to have people, you know, say, hey, you know. But that approbation is something that you seek in your flesh, and it's not right, but it's something you have to fight. But what I'm saying is, is that when I get at the Bama seat, I'm given an account for my own service to Jesus, but also if I am faithful to you, I will be rewarded. So I, there are times I show up here, I might not feel good. Uh, I had a sciatic thing where I, I was like absolute excru- excruciating pain to stand up amazingly. It's like ridiculous how, what, is, what happens when you get old. And for, for a couple, for about two months I had this. So, I mean, I'm sitting there going, you know, and, or when you know, I have different things going on, I'm showing up here because I'm motivated, one, because I'm doing my job as in the Lord and I know I have to give an account to him. And that's good for you to know. You want a pastor that's like that and is uh, conscientious about his, what he's doing. And so, uh, and that's true of all you. You're all going to have to stand to give an account before Christ for your service. And so you might not feel like coming to service. You may not feel like uh, serving or whatever, uh, coming to Bible class. But God's taking an account of that. He's keeping a record of that. In fact, the elect angels do sort of things like that. So when I stand before Christ, like Paul and, and Silvanus and Timothy, I will give an account. And so Paul's saying, we're, we've been faithful to you. We, we, we're uh, been conscientiously being faithful to God and to serve you. And we know you will be our joy. It'll be great joy to see you grow to maturity and get rewards and we'll be rewarded. So to be, uh, I, so when you grow up to maturity, I will be rewarded because I'm instrumental. I was used by God and being instrumental in helping you grow to spiritual maturity by feeding you the word of God and shepherding you and helping you and uh, answering questions or a plot, trying to help you apply the word of God or dealing with your trials and tribulations. That's that's why I will give an account, and I will be rewarded if I am fa- found faithful by the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at verse seventeen again. It says, "But when we were separated from you, brothers and sisters, for a short time, in presence not in affection, we became all the more fervent in our great desire to see you in person." So, where uh, the Acts seventeen is, it tells us, records for us. The, it gives us the circumstances, the account of why Paul and Silvanus were separated from the Thessalonians. So if you could, uh, hold your place and look at Acts 17. Look at verse 1. Acts 17, 1 through 8, gives the account of uh, Paul and Silvanus uh, evangelizing the Jews. It doesn't mention anything about the Gentiles. And, uh, and, but First Thessalonians, which was written to Gentile Christians, uh, Paul and Silvanus must have been in that city several months, at least, I think at least six to nine months easily, maybe even a year, uh, to, evan- uh, to basically evangelize the Christian community in that city and then feed them the word of God and minister to them for a period of time. And, and uh, you know, I, I talked about that in our introduction to this book. So for, uh, Acts 17 actually records why Paul and Silvanus said what they said in 1 Thessalonians 2.17, that they were separated from the Thessalonians. Look at Acts 17.1. After they traveled, Paul and Silvanus, or uh, he sometimes called Silas, remember, after they traveled, Paul and Silas, through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. Paul went to the Jews in the synagogue, as he customarily did, 
And on three Sabbath days, he addressed them from the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. Just like Jesus talked to the, the two disciples of his after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus in the Gospel of Luke. And he basically showed them from the Old Testament scriptures how he had fulfilled those Old Testament scriptures with regards to the, 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 uh, the, the suffering and crucifixion of the Messiah and his resurrection from the dead. So then he goes on to say in verse 4, uh, some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large group of God-fearing Greeks, that would be Gentiles, and quite a few prominent women. So there are some Gentiles that are mentioned there uh, as having believed. Verse 15, but the Jews became jealous in gathering together some worthless men from the rabble in the marketplace, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. They attacked Jason's house, trying to find Paul and Silas to bring them out to the assembly. Now stop there for a second. Why in the world would these Jews be that upset with Paul and Silas? You've got to understand where they're coming from. They're Jewish. Jews are monotheistic. The Jews of Paul's day were monotheistic, meaning unlike the Gentiles of the world who worship multiple gods, they didn't. They were monotheistic. So in a lot of ways, the Jews are a lot like us. In fact, Christianity is a derivative of Judaism, really, in a, in a sense. But they thought that they're, the Christian, the Jewish Christians, like Paul and Silas, worshiping Jesus as God, as Yahweh, was outrageous. They didn't think that was appropriate. They thought he is a Jew who was condemned by our own Jewish council, Sanhedrin. He was convicted of blasphemy. He declared himself to be God. How could he be God? He's a man. And Jesus said, well, if you don't, you don't believe what I say, believe me by my works. Walking on the water, healing people of diseases, giving sight to the blind, raising people from the dead like Lazarus. Who does that? And then himself rising from the dead. Only God could do that. So uh, we see that the Jews, because they were monotheistic, they thought it was a corruption of their religion that because the, remember it says in the law, you shall love the Lord thy God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You should not uh, love any other gods. You should worship just me, no other gods. Well, they thought Christianity was a, a corruption, a perversion of their, of their religion, Judaism. Okay, so that's why they were so upset with Paul and Silas. They did. They didn't see Jesus as they see, saw him, as, of course. Look at verse six again. And, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials screaming. These people who have stirred up trouble throughout the world have come here too. And Jason has welcomed, welcomed them as guests. They're all acting against Caesar's decrees, saying there is another king named Jesus. They caused confusion among the crowd and the city officials who heard these things. And after the city officials had received bail from Jason and the others, they released them. Verse 10, the brothers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea at once during the night. So why? Because they were afraid that Paul and Silas were going to be victims of violence. That's why they sent them out of the city. That's what Paul is referring to in 1 Thessalonians 2.17 when he talks about being abruptly separated from the Thessalonian Christian community. Now you can go back to 1 Thessalonians 2.17. So 1 Thessalonians 2.17, but when we were separated from you, brothers and sisters, for a short time, in presence, not in affection, we became all the more fervent in our great desire to see you in person. Now the but that starts off the verse, it's telling us there's a contrast between this verse and the verses pre, uh, preceding it, verses 13 through 16. So 1 Thessalonians 2.17 asserts that when Paul and Silvanus were orphaned from the Thessalonian Christian community for a short period of time in presence, never in heart. They made every effort with great desire to see each and every one of their faces. So uh, there's an interesting metaphor that I'm going to talk about here this morning. It's very beautiful. And the Net Bible translates this word as separated. We were separated. It actually means to be orphaned. 
Uh, that's the, I, the metaphor. I'll, I'll give you some uh, 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 quotes from some scholars about it. But I even think some, some of these translations, English translations, bring that out. But it's a very beautiful metaphor. And it talks about the intensity of Paul and Sylvanus' love for the Thessalonians, which is quite, it's really incredible. And uh, it's uh, th- that he, they had this intensity of a, a feeling toward them. Now, this statement in verse 17 stands in contrast to the previous assertions in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, which describe unsaved Jews who oppose the Christian community's pr- proclamation of the gospel. So if you compare verses 14 and six through 16 with verse 17, the contrast is between Paul and Sylvanus and these unsaved Jews who are described in verses 14 through 16 as murdering murdering our Lord and Savior and the prophets of Israel, persecuting the Jewish Christian community in Judea, as well as persecuting Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy. Now, when he says we, but when we, the word we is ego. Now, interesting, the verb in Greek already has the first person plural form in it. So when the writer uses the personal pronoun, it seems to be redundant. It's, it's in Greek. It, it's not. What I mean by that is the ver- a word that's a verb in Greek. It has the we in it. You, so uh, the word that's in here, we don't really need to translate. Uh, if they, uh, we would translate the verb here, we were separated. But it has this pronoun in it, which would be we, we were separated in a way. But there's a reason why they do that and they put the personal pronoun in. It's referring to Paul and Sylvanus, but it's doing a couple of things. It's, 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 it's presenting a contrast and it's used for emphasis. So up to this point in this epistle, this word we is referring to Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy. However, here in verse 17, it's only referring to Paul and Sylvanus and not Timothy, which is, and I know this from two passages, one which we read and uh, this one, uh, th- this passage we're in, First Thessalonians two seventeen to tw- uh, twenty, is also indicating this. In Acts seventeen eleven, as we just read, that uh, this, uh, that Paul and Sylvanus are the we in First Thessalonians two seventeen, and not including Timothy, is that in Acts seventeen, the church in Thessalonica sent Paul and Sylvanus away to Berea, and they don't mention Timothy as being in their party. Furthermore, in First Thessalonians three one. Uh, Paul and Sylvanus, after they were separated from the Thessalonians, they sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage them with regards to their faith. So the we here in 1 Thessalonians 2.17 is more than likely just Paul and Sylvanus because they're the ones that actually established the church. Timothy wasn't with them in Acts 17, it appears. He's not mentioned in their party. Now, let's go further. Because now the description of the Thessalonians is quite interesting. It also expresses the great emotion that Paul and Sylvanus had toward the Thessalonians. The the word, um, it says, brothers and sisters, great translation by the Net Bible, Adelphos. And this word, uh, you see in the older translations, they translate it brothers. It actually can be translated brothers and sisters, which I do in my translation, or it could be your fellow believer. It can be translated that way. It's speaking, speaking of someone who's a Christian without reference to his gender or her gender, whether they're male or female. It's just a word that's a general term that has no emphasis upon the gender of the person. It's a description of all Christians, men or women. So what it's doing here, though, it's in what we call the vocative case in the Greek, and it indicates that this is an emphatic, emotional statement from Paul Savanus, to the, uh, to the Christian community in Thessalonica. So when he says, but when we were separated from you, brothers and sisters, the brothers and sisters, Adelphos, is like expressing their tremendous intensity of emotion towards them. Meaning, we were orphaned from you. We, lo- we, I lo- we love you so much. We miss you so much. And this is, uh, this is we, 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 we felt orphaned from you. We, we, se- we were separated from you, but in a sense of being orphaned from you. And we'll talk about this metaphor, which is quite interesting, which gets, which we come to now. Uh, uh, the word is aporphanizo. Aporphanizo uh, is translated, we were se- se- separated in uh, here in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 17, in the Net Bible's translation. So um, this word is actually used in a figurative sense of causing someone to be an orphan. And it deeply expresses the anguish of Paul and Sylvanus as a result of being abruptly separated from the Thessalonian Christian community. So it's expressing the intensity of their anguish that they were separated from the Thessalonians. 
And we saw why they were separated. So Paul and Silvanus are expressing to the Thessalonian Christian community the idea with this verb that their forced departure from their city was like being orphaned from them. The metaphor is not only expressing the idea that they were forced to depart from Thessalonica abruptly, but also the deep anguish and loss as well as grief Paul and Silvanus experienced as a result of this departure. They missed them. They loved them. They spent time. They enjoyed their company. They felt the connection to them because they're the ones where they were spiritual fathers to these Thessalonian Christians. And so imagine that they, they, they felt so badly that they were separated from them because of the persecution. They didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay and help them. But now they were forced to leave. And this letter and this word here is basically expressing how the deep anguish that they felt. You know, it'd be like if you were separated from your, ch- in fact, this word orphan, as I'll show you, in a quote from a great scholar, Jeffrey Weimer, the word orphan is not simply used of a child being separated from his parents, okay? It's also used in Paul's day as a, a parent being separated from their child for whatever reason, could be death. And it, so this word is not used for both the parent's perspective of losing a child, separated from a child, or a child being separated from his parents. It was used both ways, not just the way we use it in English. It was used that way in the first century. So that's very important because we're, we're going to miss we're going to miss what Paul and Sylvanus are actually saying about their attitude to the Thessalonians. So um, let me give you this quote from the guy named Jeffrey Weimer, who is he's actually a great a great commentator on the book of um, uh, Thess- First Thessalonians. And here, here, listen to his comment. He says. Uh, that Paul, and I'm quoting from him, Paul further reassures the believers in Thessalonica of his deep love for them, despite his continued absence, by making use of another vivid family metaphor. Now, he says another, I pointed to you, there's several family metaphors, uh, like a father, a mother, nursing child. These are all things that Paul and Silvanus and Timothy were using to describe uh, themselves in their attitude and their function with the Thessalonian Christian community. So he goes on to say, Wyman says, the emotional power contained in this metaphor is unfortunately weakened in many translations in one of two ways. Most problematic are those renderings that hide the metaphor of orphans completely uh, by emphasizing instead the figurative sense of separation in the verb aporphanizo. Now, the Net Bible does that. They translate it separated. You're not getting the, and I'm not, a, everybody knows I love the Net Bible and we read it here. But not every translation is perfect and, you know, but there are some, uh, some translations that actually bring out the metaphor in this, in this, with this word. For instance, the Today's NIV, which is a great translation. By, by the way, the NIV, the Today's NIV, they're great Bibles to sit down and just read for your own pleasure. I do that all the time with the NIV. It's a great, it's, I find it's more readable. Now, they use, the, they translate this word correctly. They translate it, but brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you, so they're more, they're what we call a dynamic equivalence. They're trying to really bring out the sense of this particular word in the Greek and not just trying to translate it with one English word. So they say, I like this translation, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. So the Lexham Bible, uh, but when we were made orphans by separation from you, great translation, brothers, for a short time in face, not in heart, we were even more eager with great desire to see your face. So notice there's a couple of translations that bring out what the Net Bible doesn't bring out, and namely the metaphor here. So then we, let's keep going with the, the, the quote from um, uh, Weimar because it helps us understand what Paul's saying in the original. Some commentators, he says, similarly, similarly claim that the metaphor cannot be pressed since this verb came to have the more genera- generalized sense of deprived of or separated from someone. But as John Chrysostom, great Bible teacher in the uh, four, third and fourth century. He said, observed long ago, he, Paul, did not say separated from you, nor torn from you, or, nor left behind, but orphaned from you. He sought for a word that might sufficiently show the pain of his soul. But even the translations and commentators who do rightly con- include the metaphor of orphans nevertheless minimize the force of Paul's language by failing to see that it is the apostle and his co-workers who are the children orphaned from the Christians in Thessalonica 
rather than the Thessalonian believers who are children often from Paul and his fellow missionaries. This error is rooted, look what he says here. This error, I mentioned it earlier. This error is rooted in the belief that this verb, apor phanizo, was used to refer, refer either to children who had been orphaned from their parents or conversely, parents who had been orphaned from their children. So as I said earlier, it's used both ways. Don't, this is why you have to look at the Bible, interpret the Bible from its historical context and literary context. You don't, when you look at the word orphan in your English translations, you're just simply thinking, oh, like a child. But parents would consider themselves to be orphaned from their children if they were separated from their children for whatever reason. It's very important, okay? So we want to understand what Paul's original audience would understand him to say. That's why God raises up men with the gift of teaching and who are scholars too and your pastor who bring these things out because you don't have the time to do that. You're, you're, God, doesn't, it, God raises up men to do that for you so you can go. That's what you do with your English translations. You know, that's, we do that all, uh, with, with English translations just starting with that. So then we'll close with this, He's, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the quote. Since the closest previous metaphor used by Paul to describe his relationship with the Thessalonians is that of the apostle as father and the readers as his children, many conclude that the orphan metaphor in 1 Thessalonians 2.17 envisions Paul as the father who is separated from his Thessalonian children. This conclusion is contradicted, however, he says, by the use of this verb in extant literature. So, he, he, uh, let me skip through the, uh, to, the, uh, to the end because he gets some technical things I don't want to uh, uh, bother you with. So Paul, by employing the verbal, uh, Paul, he says, presents himself and his co-workers as children whose forced departure from Thessalonica has meant that they are orphaned from the believers in that city. So that's what he's, so what you need to understand is that Paul's not looking at the Thessalonians here in 1 Thessalonians 2.17 as being orphaned from him and Paul, uh, Silvanus. He's saying, we're like children who've been orphaned from you. So he, he, has, he, he, he did this kind of interesting with the other metaphor, saying that we were like nursing infants. That's a weird way to describe you as. Well, he said that because he used that metaphor to, 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 to express their innocence. Like infants are innocent of sin. I mean, you know, being deceitful and trying to get, uh, you know, approbation from people and exploiting people for money. We're innocent as infants would be in that area. Okay. So that's very important. So Paul used, Paul was kind of strange. You know, one of those things in writing they say is not to mix metaphors. Well, don't tell that to Paul because Paul used mixed metaphors all the time. And so he did that because he could do that in the Holy Spirit. He didn't go by any kind of laws or rules uh, that we have today. Now, go, uh, if you haven't, uh, you should be back at 1 Thessalonians 2.17. 1 Thessalonians 2.17. So this amazing and powerful metaphor presented here in 1 Thessalonians 2.17, of Paul and Silvanus being orphaned from the Thessalonians, is the fourth one employed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 to express their care and their concern and affection that each felt toward the Thessalonian Christian community. All right? So, again, look at verse 17 in your translations. But when we were separated from you, or we could say, when we were orphaned from you by separation, Brothers and sisters. Remember, brothers and sisters is an emotional address to them. This word that's translated, we were separated in your net Bible. It's a word that expresses the great anguish of Paul and Silvanus being separated from the Thessalonians. So what I'm telling you is there's a lot of emotion here. Here's very important. God's love. There are some people in Christianity, and this is very bad because it makes people out to be robots or without emotion. God's love, some people in Christianity think that the love of God is without emotion. Are you kidding me? How can you say that? Paul has given us a perfect example. God's love expresses affection. Do you think the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit don't have affection for each other? Now, I know some people, they've come from families, and that's just, you know, this is the thing they, they, that you have to overcome, where my family is very affectionate. So for me, affection is not a big deal. But for some people, they didn't have that for whatever reason. Maybe their parents weren't affectionate themselves, or maybe they were alcoholics or whatever, and they, you know, they beat up their kids or whatever. Who knows? But people have their reasons for why they're not affectionate. And, but affection is actually a normal, normal human function. There should be affection between parents and children and vice versa. There should be affection between Christians. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. 
<laughs> We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We should have great love and concern and affection for each other. This is our true family. Our natural family, unless they're born again and saved, they're not going to be with us for all of eternity. Only those who are born again and saved are, that's our true family. So there should be affection for each other. Paul mentions that in Romans chapter 12. We should have affection and concern for each other. We should like to be around each other. Now, I know some people are difficult to be around and, and they're difficult. That's when you operate in toleration and forgiveness, operate in the love of God. You can work around that. You can deal with that. But in general, we should be very much, uh, uh, have a great affection for each other. So Paul and Sylvanus, they're giving us some uh, 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 insight into the heart of a great pastor or pastors here. This is how a pastor should be toward his congregation. And I know, you know, it's very easy. If you don't operate in the love of God, people could, you know, I don't know if anybody who works in the public domain, people are difficult, right? Well, pastors have to deal with the public, people in the public, and people can be difficult. So you have two choices. You could be what the world does and get angry, get bitter, lash out, and that, you know, and leave. Or you could operate in God's love. And so when people get difficult in your ministry, you operate in forgiveness and tolerations and patience and pray for them instead of getting angry and retaliating. And so, and that's the way we should be in our families the same way. So we should be, uh, so there should be a, 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 you know, pastor should be someone who actually cares about his people. You know, he's not sitting in an ivory tower and doesn't care, you know, doesn't care about them. I was, I, I was um, talking to somebody, I, I was, I was at, uh, out someplace with, uh, uh, with uh, Titus and Jody and we were at, and I was talking to some people there, and, and they were asking me about what I did. I, I said, well, I'm a pastor. I, I think I offered the information. So we're talking, and, oh, you know, they, they were going to this church and everything. And I told yeah, we just got a little, you know, a little house church. I said, the great thing about it is, is, is that I know everybody in my church. I know, I know I'm around them so much. I said, we teach three times a week. So a lot of them, I know very, I know their weaknesses and their strengths and their, 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 you know, their, their little idiosyncrasies and they know mine. And I know their kids. I know their, I know their kids. I know their, you know, like Bill and Krista, their kids when they're born. I, I was there, you know, go see them in the nursery and Nathan was this little peanut and everything. I remember all that. I remember Tyler and Cheyenne when they were little rugrats. I remember Titus brought him in before he met Jody. And then, you know, Titus brought these little kids in. This is where I preview. And they were running. Oh, they were hellions. They were running all around. The, they were in a daycare report, guys, all day. And they go, you know, he'd pick them up. And then he'd ride an hour to Bible class, the poor guy, as a single dad. And he'd bring those kids to church. I really respect that about him. And those little rug rats, oh, I was like, oh, my gosh, where are those kids going? They're, they'd hide and seek under the, under the, 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 the thing. And they, this, was like, this was like a big playground for them. So it is so funny. And then, you know, Jody comes in, is like, and I, I married them. And, and uh, so I know, I, you know, I know them. I know, I know, actually, I know Jody longer than I know Titus. I know Jody from uh, when we were at uh, Blairstown. So I, I know people in my congregation. You know, I know Christina and Mark. I, I, I married those two, and they were with me at, at, at Prairie View as well. And I know Mike Fletcher and some of those people on the Internet, like uh, Mike Fletcher, um, George and, and Sherry, uh, Alice and Rick. Uh, I've known them longer than I've known any of you guys. I know them back, many of them, from the, from the beginning of coming out here or when I was at Pre uh, GBC. So what my point is, I know these people. When I'm here in a big church, I met this woman when I was at Blairstown in Prairie View. She came from a big ministry. I think it was Chuck Smith's ministry in, in California. And it was, you know, there were like a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people attend service, right? And she told me, because she went to our church, and we had about 40 or 50 people at the time. And she said, you know, they don't go there anymore. They, they, they would actually, they'd like to have something like we have because in the big churches, you get lost in the shuffle. If you don't show up, nobody knows you didn't show up. Well, if you don't show up here, it's a, I know. <laughs> it's like, where, where's, where's Bill and Crystal? You know, or where, where's Tyler and Cheyenne? You know, it's like, where's Jody? Where's Tyler? You know, it's like, it's a, big, it, it's a big void. You know, it's like, you notice, I notice. So it catches my attention. These people in these bigger churches, you never know where they are. And also accountability. You know, there's no, a lot of these churches, bigger churches, that's why they break out into smaller groups, which is a better idea, good idea, because there's, you're able to minister to people and hold people accountable. And that's what we're supposed to do, hold each other accountable and minister to people, get to know people. And that's when you develop what Paul and Sylvanus had toward the Thessalonians, affection. 
and that's where you develop a great love and concern for people. And uh, so, like, for instance, you know, if, uh, people here, um, you know, you need to know if you're probably like, for instance, you, lately you've been wa- uh, wondering about, you know, I've been talking about my mother and my, you might as well know, my mother was diagnosed with dementia about four or five years ago, okay? You know, and her f- whole family had it. And she, uh, she was the young, she's the youngest of nine kids. Her oldest sister didn't die of it. She had, lived to 90s. Well, she came down with it and, I, and she called it, you know, when she saw her brothers die of it, you call it the slow death. It truly is. So you lose your cognitive ability little by little, you know. And so I know some people out here, who are pro- I'm, I'm concerned about, I don't want them to think that, you know, I'm going to leave here because of my mother. If, I, if it was about my mother, I would have gone a long time ago. Not, am I concerned about my mother? Yes. I'm, I'm still involved with them. I still help them out in different things and uh, make phone calls. I talk to them all the time. When I go out in the summer vacation, Christmas vacation, you know I used to take two weeks. Now I take three weeks and sometimes four to go to doctor's appointments with my dad, help my mother and my father, and do that, okay? But I still come back here. Why do I still come back here? I still come back here because Bill and Crystal, Mark, Christina, Titus and Jody, and the kids. I come back here because of you guys, okay? I love you guys. I'm loyal to you guys. In fact, the people who, you guys who were with me at Preview, when everybody abandoned me and deserted me, you guys stuck it out with me. So, yeah, I'm wicked loyal to you. I'll come back. I, I would do anything for you guys. And I have, the only way I would leave here is if you guys didn't want me to be anymore. The types that say, the Thompson said, well, we really don't want to listen to you more, and we, you know, we, we really don't like you. <laughs> See you later. Goodbye. That, that's, I would have, or there was no financial support, and just went, Pfft. But even then, but I'm still here because I love and care for you guys. As much as I love my family and parents and everything, I'm still here. That's most important. That's my God's will for my life is to be helping you guys. And I could always fly back if there's a, a problem with my family, and I've done that, okay? So I'm here, and, you know, you're the people who wanted me to teach when everybody else was, didn't want it. Even the people, when I left Prairie View, it was Titus and Jody and Bill and Crystal and Mark and Christine and those guys, they all said, hey, we want you to stay. In fact, Titus, amazingly, Titus is very reserved and everything, right? Well, when I knew I was going to be uh, leaving Prairie View, he picked me up at the airport because somebody else didn't do it. Titus did it. He picks me at the airport and he was like, I really think you should stay. I was like, Okay, but in my mind, I was like, I'm going to have to pack it up and leave, okay? Because this, what, what are we going to have, you know? He said, no, I really think we, you know, we can meet my house, blah, blah, blah. I was like, all right, and uh, you can, Jody wants you to finish Romans. I like, okay, better do it. Jody, I don't want Jody, you know, getting mad at me. Uh, finish Romans, right? So, and he was putting the pressure on me. Talk about a hard sell. I couldn't believe it. I was like, the guy, what is this guy? And I was like, what are you getting upset, Bill? I was like, I was like saying, that's a good thing. But nobody in Massachusetts, and I have people who know me in Massachusetts, that nobody came up to me and said, oh, you're out of Iowa? Come us with us. Nobody did. Nobody has done that since, okay? But there's people who still want me here, evidently right now, and that's why I'm here. What do I say this for? I love you guys, okay? I care about you. I, you know, you're a, you're a big part of my life. And in fact, if I, if I had to if I leave for whatever reason, I would be upset about that. I would feel I'm orphaned. You know, uh, so, you know, you need to know that. And I say that because I know some people may, maybe some of you out here in Iowa uh, might have that concern. Don't be. Don't be worried about that at all. I'm still here. I don't have any plan to leave unless you want me to leave. That's, uh, then I'm, I'm still here. I can still deal with my family situation on the phone, take trips, you know, back and forth. So I want you to know that. So I'm trying to make you, give you in a little application of this passage here as a personal application for myself. So, um, you know, I hope you uh, please bear with me as I, I make this uh, application. So I wanted you to get that across to every single person here. So this amazing, powerful metaphor presented here in 1 Thessalonians 2.17 of Paul and Sylvanus being orphaned from the Thessalonians is the fourth one employed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 to express their care and concern and affection that each felt toward the Thessalonian Christian community. The first of these metaphors, as we read earlier this morning, is in verse 7, which depicts Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy as conducting themselves as 
little children in the presence of the Thessalonians. The second also appears in this verse and is a figure of a nursing mother tenderly caring for her children to describe the conduct of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy when interacting with the Thessalonians. The third metaphor to describe the conduct of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy when interacting with the Thessalonian Christian community is found in verse 11. As was the case... Uh, with the contents of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 12, the purpose of 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 is to defend the character of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, and in particular, Silva- Paul and Silvanus, who established the church at Thessalonica. Now, they felt, why do they feel this need to do so? As we pointed out, they felt the need uh, to defend their conduct with the Thessalonians because they were concerned that the Thessalonians would be deceived by the accusations made against them by their enemies in the city of Thessalonica. And may I interject something? I mentioned this in the past. One of the mistakes I think I made, and there were many, when I was at Preview, when I left Preview, I should have defended myself more off, more, more stridently. And I, so why I did that, would do that? Because there were many people whose because of a few people, listened to those few people, and they went out and left, left me. When if I had defended myself more stridently and, oppo- and, and, and forcefully made my case, like Paul Silvanus were doing here, maybe some of those people would still be with me, and they would not have left. So I, I, I believe that that was a, a mistake of mine. I, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, it just could very well have been something I should have done, at least, you know... My point was that to be, I didn't want to defend myself too much, let other people, you know, st- stick up for me, at, uh, but I probably should have defended myself more. Now, the contents, let's finish off here. The contents of 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 and 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 16 suggest that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were defending themselves against their critics and persecutors. These individuals were composed of non-Christian Jews in the city of Thessalonica. We know that from Acts 17, 1 through 9, as well as non-Christian Gentiles. We know that from 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. Remember, Paul says, you Thessalonians were persecuted by your own countrymen, and they were Jew- Gentiles. Now, as we wrap up our study here, the assertion we see in verse 17 is designed to express to each member of the Thessalonian Christian community that even though Paul and Silvanus were temporarily separated from them for a short period of time, they had every intention of seeing them again. This great desire is also expressed in 1 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 13. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3, 10 quickly. We'll wrap it up. 1 Thessalonians 3, 10. Paul writes, we pray earnestly, night and day, to see you in person and make up what is maybe lacking in your faith, see? Now may God our Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Why? Because Satan's preventing it. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we do for you, so that your hearts are strengthened in holiness to be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. To, for verse 12 and 13 to take place, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy want to be there. It can't happen unless they're there to minister to them and give them the word of God. So we see further indicating that Paul and Silvanus had every intention of seeing the Thessalonians again is that 1 Thessalonians 2.18 asserts that Satan was the reason why they were hindered from seeing the Thessalonians again. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.17 and 18 with me. But when we were separated from you or orphaned from you, Brothers and sisters, for a short time, in presence, not in affection, we became all the more fervent in our great desire to see you in person. For we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, in fact, tried again and again, but Satan thwarted us. So therefore, we see that Paul and Silvanus had every intention to come back to see the Thessalonians. Why? They loved them with great affection. They are very concerned about them. They wanted to see them grow up to spiritual maturity. They want to feed them the word of God. They want to spend time fellowship with them. These are new Christians. They're not even a Christian. They haven't been Christians even two years yet. So he was very concerned. They were both concerned about the Thessalonians and they wanted to see them again. Satan had hinted it. They were praying that God and, and the Father through himself and the Lord Jesus Christ would open the way for them to go back to Thessalonica so that they could fellowship with them, minister to them, feed them the word of God, help them to different, answer different questions and whatnot, and help them in their walk with God. That's what a pastor is to do. We're seeing the heart of a great pastor here, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. We're getting insight in the first three chapters of 1 Thessalonians into the, the great uh, pastor, pastors they were. I, many, I told you when we did this introduction to this book, many people look at 1 Thessalonians 
only with regards to the prophet, the rapture, the day of the Lord, and the last two chapters of the book. But the first three chapters they overlook, and they shouldn't. It's very important for churches to understand what these guys and how they thought toward their congregation and how the Thessalonians thought toward Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy. In fact, Paul said, he got the, if you look at, uh, yeah, look at uh, uh, chapter 3, look at verse 1. The Thessalonians had the same affection for Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy as Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy had for the Thessalonians. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3.1. I promise we'll close with this. So when we could bear it no longer, we decided to stay on in Athens alone. We sent Timothy, our brother and fellow worker for God in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen you and encourage you about your faith because they couldn't do it themselves so that no one would be shaken by these afflictions, persecutions. For you yourselves know that we were destined for this. For in fact, when we were with you, we were telling you in advance that we would suffer affliction. And so it has happened as you know. So, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter somehow tempted you and our toil had proven useless. But now, Timothy has come to us from you and given us the good news of your faith and love that you always think of us with affection and long to see us just as we long to see you. You know when he got that news, Paul and Sylvanus, they were jumping for joy. They're probably doing a dance around the campfire or whatever. They were, they were thanking God up and down. Thank God they still love us. Isn't that what every pastor wants? Thank God they still love me. <laughs> you know? Well, we'll pick this up next week in 1 Thessalonians. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this message will be a great blessing and encouragement to your people and cause them to go forward in your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. You're